Hello everyone, um, welcome to this webinar today. Today it's a, an afternoon three o'clock webinar and this is one of the many webinars we do covering a whole range of issues and I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21 and Enfield Voices and today we're going to look at a problem that affects everyone. Um, we know that pollution is a serious problem worldwide. Nine out of 10 people, according to the World Health Organization, breathe air that exceeds, exceeds WHO um, limits. So that makes it quite a, a, an extensive and real problem. Now there's an organization in the UK called Global Action Plan, and we've got Ben Hudson with us today, who is going to talk to us about what they do to combat the problem of air pollution. And they do quite a lot both nationally and with local groups. And we're gonna talk about that. So, you know, welcome Ben um, for joining us today. And first, can I ask you um, if you could just tell us briefly a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, sure. Hi Francis, hello everyone watching. Um, so I studied psychology. Um, that was my interest, um, human psychology. And I became interested in the environment um, during my studies and I later completed a master's degree in um, climate change management which kind of gave me the environmental knowledge to go alongside the psychology um, knowledge that I'd picked up and my focus as a, a master's student in my dissertation was around individual engagement in this concept of climate change this big massive intractable problem that um, impacts all of us. Um, so yeah, my, my interest there was kind of the individual. Um, I later found an organization called uh, London Sustainability Exchange. Um, I was lucky enough to get a job there. I've worked there since 2013. And in 2019, LSX um, merged with Global Action Plan. So our charity, became one as um, yeah, LSX and Global Action Plan were both environmental charities and one of the kind of core um, missions or drivers is around this problem of air pollution. So in Global Action Plan, um, is it mainly air pollution or pollution in general that you deal with? So yeah, it's air pollution is where we focus efforts in our clean air team. So we have, we have two movements in Global Action Plan. One is on clean air and the other is on post-consumerism. And we work on these topics as environmental issues that we feel are underserved um, as a whole by, by community and by government. And if you think that GAP um, have been working on pollution for about 10, 12 years, you can see how much interest and change air pollution has got in the environmental agenda over that time. Okay, I mean, we'll ask you about um, the post-consumerism uh, movement in a minute, because people may wonder what that is, though some people will have an idea of what it is. But tell us about the Clean Air Day, because that's really a big initiative of yours, isn't it? So, yeah, Clean Air Day started five years ago, and it is the UK's largest public air pollution campaign. And it gives an opportunity to hundreds of supporters around the country to make their voices heard um, in concert on that day. So last year, we and you know we in the collective sense, us and the hundreds of supporters around the country, created 2.2 billion opportunities to view messages about air pollution. That's through social media, media, local events, local press, newsletters, all of that. And really it gives a chance for, for people to learn about pollution, for businesses, charities, organizations, individuals to kind of do their bit and make their mark on, on that day in particular. So last year we saw many companies using Clean Air Day to announce flexible working policies or to launch um, new products in terms of electric buses, um, all sorts of things. We saw the government re-establish their commitment to walking and cycling. Um, Clean Air Day was the number one trending hashtag among um, 
uh, MPs from all political parties last year, which is, is pretty good. And it kind of shows you how this issue cuts across politics. And it cuts across everything in society, doesn't it? I mean, government has to be involved, communities, organisations and individuals. But governments can be quite central because what they legislate on can affect air pollution. Um, and in, in the UK, do you think the government is doing enough? Because I know the UK has been found guilty by the European Court of Justice for systematically and persistently breaching air pollution limits. Do you think they have done enough? Can they do more? There's absolutely a lot more the government can do. So in 2017, uh, they set up the Clean Air Strategy, which gives us quite a good guide as to what we need to do. But it is lacking a kind of implementation plan and, and the resources as to how we implement those things and how we do those things. A lot of the onus is placed on local authorities who are often stretched um, in in all senses, resource, time, uh, budgetary. So in that sense, there is a lot more they can do. And um, uh, one thing we've seen in kind of Clean Air Day, and this year we ran some, well, we've been running some uh, regional events. So looking at different regions and kind of bringing groups together there. And we see that, that, that it varies massively between how much, um, uh, interest and resource local authorities have to be able to invest into this problem. So it's not really the case of everyone has an equal uh, like fight in it. Um, and it's a sense of those that um, are able to do more, can do more and do do more. So I think standout authorities would be kind of Leeds City Council, um, York City Council are particularly good. We've seen Birmingham uh, City Council as well. Manchester as well really stand out strongly because they have kind of big power behind them. Um, when we look at um, London boroughs, the picture is a lot more uh, disparate and diffuse and there's all sorts of constraints and issues there. So why do you think government doesn't do enough or doesn't provide the finance to local government to do it? Because, you know, pollution or air pollution particularly causes 36,000 deaths per year in the UK. Yeah, um, last year we saw the landmark ruling uh, by the coroner um, of the case of Ellie Kissy Deborah, who was named, who had air pollution named on her death certificate, which was a first in the UK. And I think that message and that face is more powerful. So she was a nine year old girl who lived in Lewisham and suffered asthma, brought on about, brought on from uh, heavy episodes of air pollution. And these were tied to instances of high pollution um, and her hospital admittance. And, and that in itself is in some ways more powerful than the number 36,000. And I, I do hope that that's starting to shake some, uh, some movement. And I think it will. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that picture is incredibly powerful and I think it has an effect on a lot of people. And I mean, we all hope government will do more. But of course, it's individuals and communities that can do more as well. And I know that you are trying to bring communities and people together to do just that. And that's a part of what you call your post-consumerism movement. So here's your chance to tell us what post-consumerism is. Yeah, so one of the uh, Global Action Plan see kind of many of the problems tied to consumerism. So well-being and environmental problems often tied to this issue of uh, consumption. So our belief is what's good for the planet is good for us. And if we look at how um, how how we consume as a society, we consume beyond our means. The, the post-consumerist movement is to look at the kind of um, inherent compassion among individuals and in communities and to tap into that as a way to derive happiness and joy from the world rather than looking to the shops to buy the next big thing. 
And how do you get that message over? Because um, it's a great message, but we've been brought up on always having planned obsolescence, always having more and more, wanting to consume more. How can you convince people that that's not the way to go, that it in fact pollutes our planet? Yeah, so one of the, the key ways we're doing that is working with young people. And young people are amazingly switched on to the issue of climate change and to air pollution and environmental injustice in a way that uh, surprises, surprises all of us. Um, and it is through working with young people that we see a, a key way of doing that, but also through challenging um, these kind of systemic norms and also creating a, a vision, an alternative, a different way to live. So one of the things that we're doing is producing um, with some young filmmakers, um, movies, alternative visions of the future. If you look at kind of Hollywood and movies that exist about a post-consumerist world, they're all very apocalyptic, Mad Max style, people are eating each other. That's not the vision of a sustainable planet or a post-consumerist planet that anyone wants. So we are trying to help create a positive future that we can all look forward to and work towards. Yeah, well, a, a consumerist society where we all eat each other, I'm sure it's not something that we would want. But you, 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 um, you do work with schools, as you say, you work with young people and you have a clean air for schools campaign, don't you? Um, how does that work? Yeah, so we have in our clean air movement, we work with businesses, schools and healthcare professionals. Um, so the schools schools work we've created a framework for schools which is essentially a big checklist um, so for teachers or students to look at ask them many questions about how they travel um, around kind of issues around the school and then this framework has um, lots of architecture behind it and it will kind of spit out a an action plan for the school to consider and we can work with the school or the school can work independently through the action plan to take steps to address air pollution at, at the school gates or um, among the community, however they kind of, you know, where their aspiration lies. Our work with um, healthcare professionals, which um, I think at this moment with, with COVID is particularly um, poignant in the sense of air pollution being tied to COVID-19 as a number of studies have kind of suggested and um, as we were just talking about the, the case of Ella um, being asthmatic um, the healthcare profession doesn't necessarily talk about air pollution as a cause of ill health which it is um, and and it is a major environmental stressor for all of us whether we recognize it or not and so having healthcare professionals talk about air pollution to patients is a is a key way for them to avoid unnecessary exposure to make different decisions and to take account of kind of the environment as a factor. I mean going back to schools for example I mean how do you make contact with schools or if a local group wanted to make contact with schools about being involved in in the schools campaign I mean how would you or how would they go about it? So we have on our website and our Clean Air Day website resources for schools, um, so the school framework and the various lesson plans, videos, activities that they can take part in. Um, I think email is really the best way to go. You'll find quite often that schools are very receptive to this, this, this topic um, within each school there will almost definitely be a kind of committee or a teacher dedicated to environment or eco as a concept. And they're usually keen to kind of, you know, they're looking for answers and hopefully this framework um, can help them in that respect. Um, yeah, so I just think email, emailing the school, having a conversation initially is the best way to, to start, it, um, start things off. I think with, um, with Clean Air Day, as well, that's a good kind of opportunity um, for schools to engage in an issue um, where, so if we saw, was it last week, we had um, Earth Day, which again was another rally point for schools and communities. 
And you also, don't you, you, you try and start up and you have started up local groups. Now, how do you go about doing that and what the local groups do? Yeah, so our project, um, Cleaner Air for Communities, which has been funded and is funded indeed by Trust for London for the last, uh, well, last several years, um, is basically looking to provide communities with the information and the knowledge and the power to, to take action on air pollution. So we know that um, air pollution is a, is a massive problem in, in the UK and in London in particular. And this issue is often compounded in um, deprived communities. So the poorer a community is, the higher the incidence of pollution. Usually it's, that's the case. I mean, how successful are you in reaching those deprived communities? Because you're right, they're the ones who suffer disproportionately. They're the ones where, you know, the, the, the waste plants are, where the incinerators are, where all of the, the problems are. I mean, how do you reach them and get them involved? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the case is that they usually are, are switched on to these issues in some respect. And similarly to the schools, they're, they're kind of keeping an ear out for solutions. And I think um, our project uh, gives a good platform for communities. Um, I think that the framework that we, we offer, the kind of support we offer, the mentoring, the training, it really enables anyone to, to get involved. And the way we kind of like to think about it is to sit alongside what's already happening and how it can fit in in concert with activities that the the group already do. So, for example, we've worked with um, many faith groups over the years and kind of sitting environmental messages alongside uh, various groups or meetings that they have, looking at how the performance of the building or kind of activities that happen in and around the building so how people travel for example um, to a place of worship uh, to create travel plans for them so really that they can they can um, they can benefit from from this knowledge and kind of help the community as a whole Okay, so is, is one of your aims to get localities to create a sort of action plan that they can share with others and also with the local authority? Yeah, so that is, so creating an action plan is a very strong um, way for a community or a group to establish their intentions in respect to, yeah, say, air pollution. And what this can do is enable them to kind of mark their intention quite quite clearly and work towards it. So within community groups as a whole, was um, having having that kind of action plan for people to coalesce around enables more and more people to get involved. So often where I've worked with community groups, we might start a conversation with one or two people um, like yourself from Aurora and that often spills out to other communities and more people get involved and it's it's a way for people to to support the the action plan so as we see at the moment lots of people might think well you know what what can i do or what can we do and the action plan really helps focus that attention on solutions that that they can be involved in do you have a, an example, a good case study of a locality, a council or whatever, who has a good action plan that's changed post-consumerist behaviour and also has made the local authority make changes that are important? Um, I'm going to answer that question in a few different ways, if you don't mind. So um, what we've seen with, um, with COVID-19 and social distancing and the way street space and public space is being used, we're seeing more walking and cycling, it just inherently as part of the issue because people can't travel as far. We're seeing people spend more time and money locally. I know in um, Waltham Forest who have pushed on the kind of locality agenda um, quite hard and created um, the Mini Holland area. I know they 
slightly changed the name of that now. Um, but studies have shown that people who walk to shop in a local high street will spend more money in that community than people that are driving in to that high street. Um, that's, that's kind of one regard. Another way to kind of answer your question is we probably worked with up to 50 different community groups over the years um, on the um, cleaner, um, cleaner Earth Communities project. And we've seen various kind of action plans and actions come out of that. So for example, we've seen them work with, with schools, we've seen them petition local councils for things such as moving bus stops because they're in a particularly bad placement on the road where uh, you know, you've got a junction with lots of car cars idling. We've seen the petition for um, electric buses. We've seen them engage with policymakers and have their voice heard. And those things feed through to things like the environment strategy or the London plan. There's lots of um, uh, changes can be brought about through the, the kind of entity that is community. Um, you also are doing some really interesting things as well, aren't you? You have a, uh, a clean air calculator that people can use as well. Um, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so that is very popular, actually. Um, so the clean air calculator, uh, which may be one of the first in the UK, um, basically calculates your contribution to air pollution. And it may make you think and realise different things about how you as an individual are contributing to pollution. So it looks at um, your, um, your travel behaviour, um, the fuels that you burn in your home, and then we're also adding in uh, deliveries. So we've seen a massive spike in this um, again throughout the lockdown period. I mean, this was a trend that's been growing for the last 10 or 15 years of um, deliveries for consumer consumer goods for um, food now, you know, everything's being delivered. And we've seen a massive spike in this. And the, the way these things are often delivered are by white vans or by motorbikes, which are heavily kind of polluting vehicles. So we factored those sort of things now into the clean air calculator. So after you take part in the calculator, it will kind of give you some suggestions about what you can do. Um. You've also got this sort of experiment in what you might call citizen science, haven't you? Um, where you can involve people in measuring uh, local pollution and you offer equipment to do that, a basic equipment, but it works, doesn't it? Uh, can you explain that? Um, yeah, so I mean, one of our key ways of engaging and working with communities is um, is through citizen science, so helping them to understand the issue of air pollution to measure uh, to measure the air pollution around them. So we use these things called diffusion tubes, which measure nitrogen dioxide. The councils and DEFRA use these things as well to measure pollution in addition to the automatic monitoring stations. And basically giving these tubes to citizens enables them to place them in places where they spend time, places that are important to them. So this could be in a park, in a bus stop, um, it could be a playground outside of school. And this gives information on pollution that isn't necessarily available in or on websites. This would be what I'd like to call hyper-local measurement. So you'd be able to measure kind of outside a school, you'd be able to measure side roads, and you'd be able to create a picture of the kind of depth of pollution. Okay, hyperloco is a buzzword nowadays. It's <laughs> a really good word to use. Um, so, you know, if, if people in a local area like our own, and they're going to talk to Aurora in a minute because we're talking about a local area here, um, you know, if they wanted to start a local group and use all these devices as well as get involved in a campaign and a, a local plan, action plan, um, how would they go about it? So we are kind of open to uh, working with groups in Enfield on this topic. I think the best thing to do would be to share my information uh, after this talk or alongside this talk and um, 
we're, we're working with um, Citizens UK in Enfield to um, basically run the citizen science program and run the creation of um, the creation of action plans and to mentor communities on this journey of of taking on pollution. Okay, so you you've you know you you've started local groups. You're doing all the things that uh, that you think are important. Are you hoping that we can now begin to make a difference? Because you know we're in the time of cli climate change, and that is definitely linked, isn't it, to the drive to reduce air pollution? So, are you hopeful that we can make a change, or have we really a big hill to climb? So, I think with um, with air pollution and with climate change, locally there are lots of solutions available and within that there are lots of quite easy solutions and free solutions available to to all of us in terms of choices we make in ways that we travel consume things um the way in, the ways in which we work i think with the lockdown restrictions potentially ending um next month um, we're going to, you know, we have a great opportunity to to kind of readdress how we do things. So I think this period has given us all time to reflect on, you know, how we work, how we live, how we want to live. And yeah, I do see this as a big kind of opportunity area. And I think that, again, more and more people are interested in the topic of the environment and of how we live. Um, and of creating solutions to these issues. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm positive, Francis. Yeah. yeah okay, okay. I mean, it's great that, that you are, and I think a lot of people are. And in a way, you know, the COVID crisis that we're going, going through has seen pollution reduce, and it's given us a time to reflect. Um, but, you know, some people are fearful that when it's over, we will go back to business as usual. How do we stop that happening? How do we move to post-consumerism? How do we stop going back to the way we've been going for decades and decades? It's caused the problems that we're in now. Well, I think being brave, right? Um, there's, there's decisions that local councils are making. Um, some are popular, some are unpopular, but they're really offering a new way forward. So, you know, how businesses are operating, um, how street space is used, how we travel, how we communicate. Um, so work, for, an, for as an example, uh, has been completely changed throughout this process. And I mean, looking at the companies and that have pledged to work remotely and flexibly, looking at um, the Welsh government who now want to move 30% of the entire workforce to remote and um, regional working. So instead of, you know, everyone commuting to a particular spot, so London, you would have more local work hubs and workspaces for collaboration in kind of your, in towns and, and regions around the city. So I think there's huge opportunities there. And I think we, so being brave and being sensible, right? So there's definitely going to be a bit of a spring back in terms of people just, um, reaching um, into the hedonism bucket quite deeply as soon as they're allowed to after lockdown. And really there's, there's you know, a lot to celebrate um, uh, to, to be able to see people and to connect again. But I, I think that, um, you know, in a longer term sense of it, there are just choices we can make. And, you know, we, we like to believe that people are compassionate and people are decent and they are looking for, um, for all of these same things that we are and you know this is a good opportunity for all of those things to come to the fore. Okay so if someone wanted to get in touch with you find out more about what you're doing start a local group where would they go what would they do? So our website which is globalactionplan.org.uk would probably be uh, one of them. We also have the Clean Air Hub um, and Clean Air Day. So there are three websites available. 
um, all of which contain a wealth of resources for schools, communities, healthcare professionals um, to, to take part in kind of all of the things we've discussed here. Okay, well, thank you for doing that. We've come to the end of our 30 minutes and we could have gone on talking about a lot of the things you're doing. And I mean, it's a great organisation you belong to and you are doing a great deal to help tackle the problem. So, you know, Ben, thank you for joining us and for telling us about it and telling people what they can do to make a difference. And I hope many of them will listen and, you know, join you in your campaign. So thank you for joining us and we'll stop uh, this uh, webinar, this interview now.